Oh, looks like you're ready to go live. Let's try that. Apparently that's the key. You're live. All right. So I'm not sure anyone actually caught that, but uh, <laughs> we're, we're just waiting, like I said, for, for YouTube to uh, catch up to our, our streaming delay. Uh, we brought all of the SL goodies tonight and uh, just going to wait a minute or two to have everyone be able to connect and uh, see how our, our stream is going. So just give us a minute. Oh, hey, there's an ad. And there's an ad. Of course there's an ad, because it's YouTube. <laughs> That's right. All right. We like it. We're fine. Thank you, YouTube, for being... Okay, here we go. Hey! That looks a lot like us. So we are live. Yes. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, this is our third week. Week uh, three. Week three. Week three of weekly YouTube live show. Yes. So this is, uh, if you're just joining us, this is uh, Red Dot Forum Cameras Talk. Uh, I'm David Farkas. This is Josh Lair. And we are coming to you live on a Saturday night. Hope everyone is enjoying their their weekend so far. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. Also, we have Jose. Don't we do. About Jose. I'm not going to forget about Jose. Okay. Jose is all the way over there. Okay. So and doing? yeah, he is our moderator and camera operator. So everyone say hello to Jose. Hello. Hello. hello <laughs> well, Jose. he's right there, so we can yeah. see him. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, again. I have to thank everybody who tuned in last week for part two of the M10 discussion. I think we had a lot of great questions. Mm -hmm. We covered a lot of cool stuff. And through the course of the of the past week, David and I both uh, received a lot of direct and indirect correspondence from people that, you know, had follow-up questions and, you know, just tuned in and enjoyed it. So, yeah. We're going to keep this going as long as we can. I, I don't think we're ever going to run out of Leica-themed things to talk about. So, so much stuff to talk about. What do we got tonight, David? So tonight... As it may or may not be apparent, mm -hmm. we are talking about the Leica SL system. So that includes the SL601, the OG. the OG SL here, and the SL2, along with SL lenses. This one's hiding. It's 9280. Big guy. Uh, we also are going to talk about maybe some alternative options like mounting S lenses, or R lenses, or M lenses. For TL lenses and everything else under the sun. So. Right. Because the SL system is so flexible. I mean, basically, you know, Leica created this system in 2015, if you don't know about the SL, and they wanted to create a professional mirrorless camera. So mm -hmm. they waited a long time to, to bring out the SL until the technology was right, until they could have a viewfinder that was, they called it iRes, or basically, you know, as good as an optical finder. Mm -hmm. Uh, the original SL601 that came out five years ago now has a four and a half megapixel EVF right. that is outstanding. It's still one of the best on the market five years later. Yeah. And you think about it, how long did it take for any manufacturer to come close to that? Probably four years. Yeah. yeah like, four years. Yeah, three and a half um, years. And that's, we're talking about the original SL. Yeah. Um, you don't always associate... Not the SL2. You don't always associate Leica as a technology leader in the sense of, you know, they have this sort of old school vibe. Mm -hmm. But when the SL came out, it was really a game changer for them. Very much and so. And for everyone. I mean, I think it helped all, the whole mirrorless market kind of come into the modern age with a lot of the tech that it brought to the table. Well, I remember at that time, you know, you the mirrorless experience, and experience wasn't always the best because you would have, you know, a little bit of lag, like you take a picture and then you'd have a blackout mm -hmm. as the images are processing. So they didn't just wait for the viewfinder technology. Right. The thing is super fast, so 10 frames a second with no blackout. Uh, it was, again, revolutionary where Leica created this. Yeah. And it was one, another one just like a lot of Leica projects from the ground up. This was this is entirely a Leica, yeah. I'm pointing at a camera you guys can't see, <laughs> entirely <laughs> a, a, a Leica creation. Yeah. Uh, so both Josh and myself have been shooting with the SL extensively for the last five years. Yeah, since day one. I yeah. mean, it checked a lot of boxes for both of us. Kind of, we both have come from SLRs and come from sort of the larger camera world and transitioned into M, and now we have the option to shoot both, and it's been fantastic. I still yeah. find myself grabbing the SL most of the time, <laughs> or the SL2, although I shoot a lot of different things, as does David. Yeah. But um, Leica really took everything they learned from the original T, cameras before that, from the S, mm -hmm. for everything, and their technology partners to make the SL into, even now, five years later, the original SL601, I think, is still probably one of the most viable 
Oh, it's great. Mirrorless cameras you can buy, yeah. especially what used ones are selling for too, which is crazy. Um, so why don't you, um, before you do any questions, start mm -hmm. to talk about what, like if I have an SL, what is for you the most exciting developments from the SL to the SL2? And I'll say a few of mine, but you go first. Well, it's funny, I made a video about that. You did. Um, I don't you can check out about, yes. so <laughs> actually before I get into all of this, right, yes. I do want to point out, I learned a lot from our previous videos. Uh, so I, I made an offer to provide presets for like M10. Lightroom presets. Lightroom presets yes. for my, my Lightroom presets for yes. like M10. Uh, the response to that was... <laughs> a little crazy. Overwhelming. Uh, thanks so much for reaching out and thanks for your patience as I got back to everybody because I did want to give everyone an individual reply. Uh, and a lot of you asked for other presets besides M10 and I'm again, happy to oblige. So this time around, mm -hmm. I'm kind of cutting that off of the pass yeah. and I'll make this offer. If you're interested in my SL601 or SL2 Lightroom presets, look in the video description below. Just scroll down and you'll see a link to download the presets to your computer, save them, import them into Lightroom, and have a, just have fun. Uh, if you have any questions, yes, you can hit me up at david at red .forum, uh, but it should be pretty self-explanatory. Also, I have left down in the description links to pretty much every relevant Red Dot Forum YouTube video and Red Dot Forum article relating to the SL and SL lenses. So I highly recommend, if you want to learn more about the SL system, Go through the links, read it, uh, yeah. everything from the original SL601 review to a discussion with the uh, designer of the optics to how they were designed to the SL2 to changes, all that. And lens reviews as well. And lens reviews. lens reviews. Kirsten just did an amazing lens review slash travel log, um, the 35 SL. Mm -hmm. I have a review of the 75 mm -hmm. SL. Uh, Synchron, the 5014, 90 to 280, 90 to 280, yeah. a bunch of them. Yeah. So check those out. Uh, also, if you're looking for somewhere to purchase SL gear, either new or used, because there is a lot of great deals on used 601s, mm. which and a lot of used lenses. Yeah. Uh, I left links to Leica Store Miami down below. So check those out too. Absolutely, it's changing every day. So. It is. Uh, also, before we dive right. into stuff... The most important part of the entire night. This is very important. Yes. So, we, we announced it on social media, but I'm not sure everyone had an opportunity to enter. So, we are giving away a little giveaway, because it is a, a live show. you got to do fun stuff, That's right? That's right. Several things. Not several just things. Not so just we've got, one little thing. Several things. So, we have a Red Dot Wear swag bag, uh, which is going to be this stylish uh, t-shirt here, which is a uh, really cool... M10 pocket tee. It's actually hiding down there. And a uh, SL collectible pin, enamel pin, and a really cool uh, Oscar Barnack technical drawing. This is actually an original patent drawing from 1932, I believe. Yep, 1932 for a rangefinder camera. And it's a really nice, uh, clean canteen, stainless water bottle. How do they enter? Let's get to the good stuff. All right. Uh, <laughs> if you want to enter, yes. the contest is this. It's a question. It is a question. A trivia question. It is a trivia question. Yes, it is. So last week, uh, when we were talking about the M system, mm -hmm. I mentioned that there is a very special, notable individual who had stacked three of the macro adapter M's and used it with a Noctilux to go do nature micro photography in the woods. If you want to leave a comment in the video of who that special person is and you get it right, uh, we will enter and then Jose is going to jot those names down and we're going to do a live drawing at the end of this video. So stay tuned because someone's going to be winning the swag bag. That's right. Let's get to the good stuff now. And let's and pay attention to this okay. video so you can win next week's trivia. Okay. All right. Got it. SL2. SL2. What do you like about the SL2? What got you most excited about the SL2 from the SL601? Go. It has a number two after it. Uh -huh. uh, that's the most exciting. That's, yeah, of course. Okay, so the biggest feature that I think most people were... Oh, for you. I want to know what you got excited about. I don't care about these people. I don't know about you. I tried. I got excited about it. Yeah. Well, I want to say what's exciting. Okay. Uh, for me, the I think... The biggest feature update for me is the in-body image stabilization. Mm. 
which is interesting because I usually haven't needed it. I, I didn't really need it on the S. I don't use it on the M. Uh, I use the CL a lot for my personal just family travel, and I never have a problem with not having IS. But having the image stabiliza stabilization, sensor-based image stabilization in the SL2 was like, oh my gosh. Uh, yeah. I mean, I've been able to do handheld photography at ridiculously so speeds. I actually did one uh, with the 1635, which admittedly is a very wide field of view, right. which means that if you move a little bit, you don't really see it. Um, but on the flip side of that, because like I raised the resolution by double to 47 megapixel on the SL2, uh, it's definitely a lot more critical to get sharp focus and, and lack of motion blur. Mm -hmm. I've actually done sharp handheld pictures at one second at which 16 millimeters. Now, David just, has very steady hands, so. Uh, not that steady. They're pretty steady, steadier than mine, anyway. I mean, uh, I've only had two cups of coffee today, so I'm pretty steady, but like, this is nuts. Um, and in, you know, real practice, I'd say, l let's say that's not, everyone's not gonna get a sharp picture in a second, but being able to shoot at a 15th of a second sure. or a 30th of a second with sure. that high resolution is, Mind blowing, yeah, um, and it, and not just acceptable, like tack sharp. Yeah. So that's the most exciting thing for me. What okay. about for you? Oh, I mean, I was gonna say the same thing probably. Uh, either I think the improved viewfinder and ergonomics, like, there's a lot of cool new features and interface and menu with the SL2. But if I told you you couldn't play with any of that, and I just handed you the camera and you said go and shoot, yeah, which is kind of what I did when we first got it. I know the ergonomic improvements seem minor, but it's to me huge. The, the, the revised grip, the leather yeah, the covering little, now that yep. it reaches over the front of the body. Yeah, um, so this here versus... Yeah. I'll put this in the front. That, that the ergonomics and the, view, the improved viewfinder, which is now 5.68 megapixels instead yep. of 4 4.4, um, with a faster refresh rate of 120 frames per second, super smooth. Very smooth. That was it for me. Yeah. And that was before you get into all the uh, super cool features and new enhancements, and I mean, there's more than I could possibly... Because I don't use a lot of gadgets, you know, I just want the tool to work for me to make pictures that I like. So I think that was, that was kind of two answers in one. So yeah, I mean, there's was, more, yeah. obviously there's, there's more. There's so much like. more, but we're gonna, we're gonna try to get to some questions. Um, so at least we can, you know, get a little, anything uh, relevant here. So Jose, what do yeah. we got? All right, so we have, we have some pretty good questions tonight. Uh, we're gonna start off with some that came in through email earlier okay. today. Okay. Um, Charles, he had a few really good questions. First one being, in trading up to the new SL2 from the original SL, the Type 601, what accessories will not work with the new SL2? Not work. Not work. Not work. Well, yeah. that actually is very important because yes. I discovered that when I tried to use certain accessories on the SL2 when I first got it, and I was sorely disappointed. <laughs> uh, I would say the one of the biggest ones is this one right here, which I probably should have grabbed a wrench. Uh, That's okay. This is a really right stuff L bracket. Uh, I don't know if you guys can see how clearly you can see that on the video, but there is basically, and maybe we can get a, I am going to get a close up because if you are shooting landscape like I am, this is one of the absolute best accessories. Like it does not make this. Uh, it is only made by a company called Really Right Stuff in California. There, there we, go. we go. And you can see here what's really cool about it. Actually, this one doesn't have a battery. Uh, what's really cool about it is you're able to... Backwards. There yep. you go. You're doing it like mirror in a mirror. Yep. There we go. So you can still access the battery here. Beep, beep, beep. There we go. Mirror in mirror. Right? You can still access the battery without removing the plate. Uh, it screws in with an Allen screw there. Right. And... But we don't want to go get too much into the versions no. of this. It's more about this will not work. Right. And then it has um, an L bracket so you can mount it sideways. Somebody just told me that I think Really Right Stuff does now have an SL2 uh, bracket. It took quite a while. Yep. Um, and on a similar note, um, another third-party accessory that will not work um, is here. I'll hand it to you. Here we go. Is Switch the that. thumbs up? That's the thumbs up EPSL. Uh, certain some people love this, some people hate it. I, you know, it's what it is. But this. Well, let me throw it into the under the camera. So yeah. where that what that does is if I throw that on here, okay. So it goes right there, sits pretty nicely with the camera. And you can see my thumb position there. But Josh, you can go on about it. Yeah, it just essentially it gives you a little place to kind of hook your thumb. Um, but my point was is that the this will not work on the SL2. I, I can did even, I can show I it. did speak <laughs> with the manufacturer actually this evening in preparation for this video, and he indicated 
Initial deliveries of the EPSL2 should begin in a week or so. Um, they're just, you know, they have to make prototypes and get them ready. So don't break the camera to you. <laughs> Trying to. It actually doesn't. But anyway, so the thumbs doesn't up from fit. the SL will not work on the SL2. Um, actually, it doesn't fit. Another at all. thing that will not work uh, is the, we're getting into Leica made accessories now, the mm -hmm. hand grip. The SL601 hand grip will not work on the SL2. There is an SL2 specific grip, which David is holding. It looks very similar. Slightly different so that it works on the SL2. Uh, I believe the difference is that the lack of registration pin. Yeah. So I'll show you here. On the, on the SL2, you will notice that there is a tripod socket, but it's completely flat in front of that. On the original SL, there was a little hole here, like an anti-rotation hole. And all of the grips and quick releases and all that uh, had a, a pin to go in that registration hole. And a lot of people have said, why did Leica do this? Why did they make it incompatible? And the answer is kind of interesting. You'll notice that this is obviously with the tripod socket directly in line with the center of the lens. So what they wanted to do uh, for the image stabilization, which I said is such a great feature, they needed to have a gyroscope. And that gyroscope has to be at the center axis of the lens at the lowest possible point on the camera. Well, guess what? That puts it squarely right where that little hole was. So Leica decided it was better to have really effective five-axis image stabilization than to have a little registration hole. There we go. So and that, that's the reason. The grip? Okay. And the last thing, which I don't have here, is the cable release, the remote release. SL has a different remote release than the SL2. Other than that, everything is the same. Batteries, memory cards. Yep, same battery. Straps, of course, lenses, lens accessories, uh, adapters, that's all the same. Uh, oh, and the screen protector is different. It um, is. The LCD protection film that Leica makes for the SL does not work on the SL2. There is one coming for the SL2. Uh, they announced it earlier, it just hasn't come in from Germany yet. Um, it's a new kind, right? It's not... Um, interestingly enough, it's actually, they call it a hybrid glass protector, mm -hmm. which I thought it would be actual, like, glass. It's not. I just played with one the other day. You yeah. know, I haven't talked to you about this yet. And it's just a thicker plastic. It's actually very nice. Um, the new ones are, they're a little bit clearer and not as matte. Yeah, because the other one's kind of like a matte Yeah, yeah, it's really nice. Finish, so right? long story short, there will be an SL2 specific screen protector. Um, it's already live on our, like, our Miami website, but it's just not, uh, hasn't shipped yet. So that's it. Screen protector, cable release, grip, really red stuff, and thumbs up. Everything else. Everything else is compatible. Batteries being the most important one because if you had a bunch of batteries from your SL, you wouldn't want to have to get no. a bunch of new ones. Oh, I guess also I have it right here. Um, Arch de Mono. Right, Arch de Mono. Thank you, Julie. Um, Arch de Mono is a, a company in South Korea that we um, sell their half cases, straps, wrist straps, neck straps. They make half cases for pretty much every Leica that there is that's current. And the SL Type 601 half case, which I'm holding, will not fit on the SL2. Um, they're working on an SL2 case. It's not in yet, but that's something that will come. So, right, half cases, add that to the list. So, it's not a long list. Most things will work. Obviously, you know, batteries, lenses, lens adapters are the big ones. Um, you wouldn't want to have any changes there, and there nope. aren't any. So, um, good question. Next question. Okay. Let's see. Can I use the new SL2 for digiscoping with my Televid 82? You can. The thing sure. about digiscoping is digiscoping isn't the same as like using a telephoto lens. It's not going to get you that level of image quality. It's more about documenting to say you saw a particular bird or you saw a particular boat or whatever. You're going to get a lot of vignetting because that image circle that the digiscope or the, the spotting scope projects is very small. You have to crop. Um, you can do it. It's better on something like a, a CL or a smaller sensor camera or even a point and shoot. Yeah, um, with a wider angle lens. So you can do it. Um, it certainly works. They do make an adapter. It's just not something that it's not as exciting as it sounds uh, right. from a image quality perspective. But from documenting, sure, it works fine. All right, next. All right. But in all fairness, it's not something that either of us. Oh, have. that's right. We I play with it, but it's not. Yeah, Kirsten can answer that question better if she was here only. Yep. All right. Can you talk about the weather ceiling and compare it between the original SL and the SL two? Sure. That's a David question right there. Yes, it's weather sealed. All right, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it is ridiculously weather sealed. Uh, I would say about the same between the two generations. I believe the new one is technically IP56. I don't know. I believe uh, someone I can specs. correct me, but uh, I'm pretty sure that's what it is. In in David terms, here's what it is. Uh, when I first 
tested out the SL2, like a lot of cameras, I wanted to actually go somewhere and just like really put it through its paces and be brutal with it because that's what I do. So I went to Seattle and to Olympic National Park. Mm. Uh, I was shooting in the Ho Rainforest in Olympic National Park. I showed up, it was drizzling a little bit. Uh, this place called the Hall of Mosses Trail, which is usually really busy. It's about a mile loop. And uh, I didn't have to worry about the people because it was a torrential downpour for six straight hours. And I kept shooting all through that. And there was nothing on the camera except the camera. Uh, I was completely drenched. I had an inch of water in my boots and I'm wearing all waterproof clothes and the camera just rocked out. I mean, it was amazing. Yeah. And I, I didn't, I didn't know if it could really with, you know, stand up to that level of, uh, of just crazy amount of water. And it did, uh, it did great. The only thing is I'd say I ran out of lens gloss. That's actually, I ran out of two things. I ran out of lens gloss, dry lens gloss, and I ran out of light. It got dark. Yeah. But otherwise, I had no reason to stop shooting other than my own personal level of discomfort yeah. and the fact that once, it, it won't prevent, the weather ceiling won't prevent water from coming on the lens, uh, but after you keep wiping the lens off with the water droplets, at a certain point when your lens gloss are soaking wet. That's right, you're done. That's it. Uh, so I had like a secret stash in that one section of my waterproof jacket that was um, still dry. A couple of notes about shooting in the rain with any weather sealed camera. We'll talk about the SL2 specifically. Number one, if you're not using an SL lens, then the lens is not weather sealed, the mount is not sealed. If you have an sure. M adapter, T adapter, or not T adapter, then what about S R adapter, lenses? look at, yeah. Not. <laughs> the S adapter L, which we'll cover later, is actually weather sealed, but we'll get there. Um, so obviously we're talking about the weather sealing has to be with an SL or an S lens. Number two, you do not want to change batteries or memory cards or make any kind of hardware changes to the camera while it's wet or in the rain. And then you've compromised the weather ceiling. Uh, number three, you want to avoid standing water on the camera. So you don't want to let any, any water um, pool in any of the spots on the camera because that pressure from the water pooling can get in. So that's the other key is, is not letting standing water uh, on the camera. I did change batteries. Yo, why would you say that? Now they're all gonna wait. Now I, gonna... I did change batteries, <laughs> okay, because they are on the underside of the camera. Oh, here we go. So the water wasn't wet. Don't inside. do what David does, but okay, bad. But big safety tip. Bad, David. big safety tip. If water is on top of this and you put it into the weather sealed camera, like Josh is saying, You're done. that's it, like it's no longer weather sealed. You now have water in your camera. And people ask sometimes why that batteries for the SL are relatively expensive for batteries. And that's because, you pull that out again and get a close up here, they incorporate w weather sealing. Uh, There's a little right o ring. There. There's a gasketing system in the battery. So that's part of the camera's body, it's part of the camera's ceiling. And that's why there are no third party batteries available. I mean, would you trust anyone else but Leica to maintain the ceiling on the camera? No. So that is one of the reasons. That's this those little batteries. here. Yeah, so it's a, a, a pretty thick rubber o ring. Yeah. And when it goes into the camera, there we go. It, it completes the weather ceiling. So it's part of the body's ceiling. Yeah, there we go. So long story short, yes, you can shoot in the rain. Don't let water pool on the camera. Don't change your battery or memory card unless you are David and you're crazy. Yeah, next question. That was good. All right. Let me see. Uh, can you talk about the, uh, the Apple SL lenses? And which one do you think is, is sharpest? You want to take that? 75, 50, Ooh. So, oh, no. Well, I have an easy answer to that. Yes. Yes. That's yes. The, they're, that's all, they're all the sharpest. So like, <laughs> just to back up that question a little bit, Leica makes a series of four Apple Supercron SL lenses for the, the SL right system. Here. They are all the exact same size in terms of this. The barrel is the same. So if I covered up the focal length, you wouldn't know. They have a 67 millimeter filter thread size. They're all the same filter. And there's a 35, 50, 75 and 90 with 21, 24, 28 coming within a year, the next couple of years. Yeah. So Eight, within the next 12 to 18 months, these lenses are designed to be basically my Siri is going. Sorry, Siri. <laughs> these lenses are designed to be far none the best. I mean, they're designed for what, 100 megapixels. Reference class. Yeah, reference. Yeah, yeah the reference. Class. Way more than 47 megapixels. I don't know if I would say one is sharper than the other. I know I've heard some people say the 35 is the best, the some 50, would say is, 50 the best. is the best. Some... I've shot with them all, and yeah. I can't say that I have my feelers from a sharpness perspective. Wow. Um, from a use case perspective, I, have, I think the 75 is my favorite because it balances 
Tele with normal, it's very hand holdable. Mm -hmm. um, this is the 75, not that you can physically tell the difference, but. <laughs> it looks exactly the same, except if yeah. you look at the front glass, it is going to be a little different if you hold those two up. There we go, you can see the 50 is a uh, little bit smaller, the yeah, actual like, size of the glass. So I think the 75 is my favorite, but again, that's just based on what I shoot, it's going to be different for everyone. Um, and and I'm a 35 guy. Yeah, he likes a 35. But in fairness, I haven't really had a chance to use the 35. Ask Kirsten. Read Kirsten's review of the 35. Kirsten's review of the 35. I read that for him. Yeah, just and that's with the original SL601, and the images still look incredible. So that takes away nothing at all from the lens. The lens is going to perform equally well on the 24 megapixel camera as it does on the 47 megapixel camera. Yeah. And I think that's where kind of that new generation of optics is, is that it's up to the task mm. of resolving even way over where 47 is. Yeah. You know, so oh, yeah. it's a lens for the next 10, 15 years, yeah. not a lens for like the next generation. I agree with that. I mean, the performance of these lenses, I mean, I've compared the 50 Apo SL to the 50 Apo M, which up until now was supposed to be the best that you could get. And it's better. I mean, it's genuinely sharper. Which is mind blowing. David has done some comparisons. Yeah, with the seventy five. Let me let me show that. Yeah, we'll pull that up in a second while I keep blathering. There, up. you can bring um, this up, Jose. So here we go. This is and I'll actually show. Well, there's, there's Kirsten's article. There's Kirsten's article. Let's. let's You'll see notice also the camera is wet because uh -huh. she also used it in a wet environment. Okay. Okay. Seventy five. And getting there. And you getting there. Mm. Okay. So here is the Apo seventy five SL review. I have links again in the video description, so you can go right to this. And I think this shows off here. You'll see. There is the, the 90, 75, 50, 35, and you'll notice they're all the same barrel dimension, just like Josh was saying. Uh, I also had this conversation here with the man behind the designs. And here's just some, you know, some photos. I think a, another misconception is that just because you have these optically perfect lenses, you know, there's that misconception that they don't have character, mm. right? That they're sterile or I, whatever. I, I think clinical is the word. Clinical, I really right, I clinical. Hate that word. I hate that word. And, <laughs> and here, I don't, I don't think that's true. You can look at Kirsten's images for sure. You can look back at these. You know, but it has, here you could see just really lovely bokeh rendering and subject isolation. And it is nice and compact. Yeah. So, you know, this picture, you know, of my daughter, you could just see that really natural skin tones, and then nice natural fall off. And this is on the 601, right? This is on the 601, yeah. right. It's not even SL2, so. Yes, I think the, so, the line oh. is great. I, I do enjoy using the zooms, and we'll talk about those lenses later, but okay, to here, the here question. Here are the comparisons, yeah. Oh yeah, okay, here we go. All right, so, uh, this is my, my famous yarn ball, uh, yarn bowl photos. So here, the top one is the SL, and the bottom one is the M, just so you can see they match. You're not gonna be able to tell much from here. And here we go. This is the 75 SL. Yeah, there's not much you're going to tell on here, but I guess the point Let, is... Let's see if we can tell. Okay, so this one is the yeah, M. I don't think they're going to see on the, on the screen here. Well, you should go and look at the article when you can, because it's really amazing. And that's the SL. Lenses that you thought were great and still are great, suddenly something new comes out like the 75 SL, and you're like, oh my God, what was I, what was I thinking? Right, right. Uh, so, okay. So there is actually the closest focus on the on the SL. That's a That's a big difference, too. If you want to use the... Let's say an M lens, remember that the minimum focus distance naturally Anyone without... tuning in now is going to be like, what the heck is going on? <laughs> right, right. Uh, <laughs> the minimum focus distance on the, on the 75 F2 is 0.7 meters. Mm -hmm. The minimum distance on the 75 Apo SL is 0.45 meters, I, I believe. Yeah, I think it's 0.4. Uh, I can actually tell you because... Oh, half a meter. So, half a meter. Now, you'd think that that wouldn't make such a big difference, but... It's huge. Uh, it is pretty big, and the detail resolution is is noticeable when you get to these lenses. So, so yeah, if you have the chance awesome. to try an Apple SL lens, you should, because it's awesome. And check out the reviews. Yes, what's next, Jose? All right, guys. We have a really good question from Jeff. Okay. Do you recommend any specific charging bank for charging SL batteries on the go? Well... Complicated. So, yeah, this... I have one sitting on the floor over there. Uh, you, do you want to well, I, take I, it? There's been, I've tried other um, third-party chargers for the SL, USB chargers. I, I've never been blown away by them. I've had mixed feelings about them. Nowadays, I just use the charger that came with the SL in the box. I think maybe he's talking about charging in camera with one of these. Like maybe this? Hold, yeah. Maybe this might be the question. Yeah, uh, I think so, yeah. So this yeah, is a battery bank. bank. 
right, that I actually use for my iPhone because it's got a little built-in, you know, because they give me a, give me a close-up action there. Uh, this is my favorite. It's called a MyCharge. Uh, what I really like about this one is that it's pretty compact, kind of pocket size, 6,700 milliamp hour, so it's got decent capacity. Flip out prong, so I can just plug it into charge. I don't need its own, a dedicated charge cable. And then it has built-in cables. This one is for my iPhone, so there's a lightning connector. And then this one is a USB-C connector, so either for an iPad Pro uh, or... Right. The, the, the question at hand. The is, question at hand, which is... Tilt it uh, up a little higher. Maybe? I'm just going to plug it in there. Yeah, okay. So you can see... There we go. So I have plugged it in, and notice on the back of the camera, the little light is flashing green now. Okay? That indicates that my battery is charging. So just to re reiterate, David, what David is doing right now is charging the battery in the SL2. This is something unique to the SL2. You cannot do this on the SL601. Correct. He's charging the battery of the SL2 while it's still in the camera using a USB battery. It's one of the things you would charge your iPhone. That's that's what's happening right now, which is, to me, a game changer. It's pretty cool. Especially for long exposures. Right? Yeah, so I'll, I'll give you another for instance. So on that same trip where I was in Olympic, I was doing some, some night photography because also the long exposures have been increased pretty significantly on the, on the SL2. Mm -hmm. So I was doing a 10 minute exposure, time exposure under a full moon, which means 10 minutes of shooting and then 10 minutes of noise reduction. Well, that's 20 minutes total of standing on a deserted beach in the middle of the night with no one around and you can't even, you know, you can't even turn your phone on because it will contaminate the scene with light. So you're sitting there in the dark and what I see is a little indicator on the battery flashing red. Uh, like the battery's gonna die with four and a half minutes to go. So I didn't wanna give up that 20 minutes and I dug this out of my pack, plugged it in, and that gave me enough juice in the camera that I was able to complete my exposure and not lose that work. So if you are gonna do long exposures, it's pretty cool to, to bring one of these or even a bigger one, keep it plugged in while you're shooting long exposures or intervalometer, mm -hmm. time exposures, uh, because then you won't have to worry about that one battery dying Especially if it's cold out or right, you exactly. know, you're going all night. So yeah, this is a handy way it's cool. to... There you go, I think it answers the question. Uh, also, oh, awesome? kind of a point of note, yeah. So uh, on a recent trip, uh, my family just went for a quick trip up to um, Pittsburgh and I forgot my SL charger. Oops. Thankfully, uh, well, you have a USB Type-C laptop charger uh, that comes with, say, a MacBook. My daughter had one for her computer, and I was able to steal her laptop charger and actually charge my battery for the next day overnight. I don't recommend time. forgetting your charger, though. Like, don't forget your charger, yeah. but what I'm saying is I was actually able to charge... A solution in a pinch. Yeah, so it's kind of cool that you can use the camera as a charger if you forget your charger. That's right, but don't forget your charger. But don't forget your charger. Next question. And I <laughs> should, we should mention also... What? Uh, it will not charge your battery when the camera is turned off. Well, right. It's not like uh, it's not like you can just have forever battery life. You don't have forever yeah, battery yeah, life. Yeah, yeah, okay. It's kind of like less not forever. Oh, so we're just glad it wasn't a long, another long story. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Let's <laughs> say so, next question. All right. So we have two focusing questions. Ooh, the first like one is focusing. from John. Okay, John. He's asking, can you set up back button autofocus on the <laughs> two? Perfect. And if so, can you show how? No. Oh, yes. So do it. Um, as a classically trained photographer, especially one who shot a lot of sports, using the technique called back button autofocus is the way I shoot. And what does that mean exactly? The short version of that is instead of the traditional half press of the shutter button to activate the autofocus, you know, to engage the autofocus on your subject, back button focus removes. Show there. I'll get there. Okay. It removes autofocus from the shutter and reassigns it to the button on the back of the camera. And every camera is different on the SL okay, and the SL2. I can demonstrate while you're talking. Okay, on the yeah. SL and the SL2, which behave the same in this regard, the autofocus, oh, when, mind, on you. Um, when you activate back button autofocus, it gets reassigned to the joystick button on the back of the camera. So again, back button focus on the SL or the SL2, it's the same. It takes the, sh the action of autofocusing off of the shutter half press. So if you half press the shutter, it's not going to autofocus. 
and reassigns it to this button. And if you think about it, if the, in, the, in the camera's default behavior, or any camera's default behavior, you've assigned two critically important roles to one button. You have the action of taking the picture and the action of activating the autofocus, both on the shutter button. And for me, that's too many important things together on one button. I want to separate those two because those are two very distinct actions that don't always happen at the same time. So on the SL or the SL2, let me pop this menu open here. Uh, you're going to go to, do this backwards, uh, the menu. Okay. And then we go to focus mode, like so. Let's make sure we get that to focus. Oh, like, there you go. There we go. We got it? I can't even see Yeah, it. you're good. Focus mode, and we put it on, normally it's on, oops, here we go. Normally it's on AFS, autofocus single. We're going to put that on MF. Now, of course, oops, you might be thinking, well, why do I want it on manual focus if I want to do back button focus? Well, like is very clever, and this is the behavior on the S uh, cameras as well. When you enter MF mode, yes, you will be able to adjust manual focus by turning the focus ring on the lens, on an SL lens. However, it automatically reassigns the autofocus actioning to the joystick button. So when you press this button in, you can see the camera's trying to focus on me here. No, not, not that camera. Just one. There I am. There's my neck. Oh, <laughs> looking ah, great. Looking terrible. great. Looking great. Anyway, this is how you now activate the autofocus. So now, in my brain, I know my index finger, here we go, my index finger is firing a shutter and taking the picture, and my thumb is on the joystick activating the autofocus. So I've separated those two important functions into two buttons instead of having them together on one. And most of the time, I think David and I both uh, do this, we work with the single point mm -hmm. autofocus on the SL or the SL2. Yeah, I like single point field. Yes, That's my favorite. I do as well. So what that allows us to do is because this joystick is also moving the focus point around, I'm able to both move the point around and activate the autofocus on that point using the same button. So you've got another layer of control and the ability to fine tune your focus. I find this helps me get a lot higher keeper rate for pictures that are in focus or out of focus. Sure. Um, I'm not at the mercy of the shutter. I don't have to keep the shutter button halfway pressed if I want to recompose and keep my focus. I'm not at the mercy of that. So one more time, just real quick. You just go to the menu, you go to focus mode. Oops, menu. I can show on the SL2 here too. Yeah. Here you go, menu. I'm doing a great job. You're doing amazing. <laughs> doing it backwards. Focus mode, MF. That's it. Menu, focus mode, MF. There is another menu option, but it defaults to the button behavior, which is AFS versus AFC. You should talk about that. Right. Soon. Well, I'm not going to get into that now because that, only because that's like another layer of complexity. I guess what I want to say is. I would encourage everyone to try back button focus if they've never done it before. It's a little bit at first kind of like rubbing your stomach and patting your head where you feel like you're disconnected. Once you get used to it, it's once very you natural. really get used very to natural, it, it becomes yeah. very natural. And you'll find that you're able to get a higher percentage of in-focus pictures. I really believe that. Um, well, and I think there's, um, I, I can think of two really distinct use cases. Yes. So let's say that you're out shooting travel photography mm. and you're in a, we're going to imagine that you're in a marketplace mm -hmm. <laughs> with a lot of people, uh, you know, but you've got your scene set and you want to focus on, let's say, the left-hand side of the frame, right? So you focus on the left-hand side, you lock your, photo, your focus in, but you're waiting for your subjects to enter. Well, when you snap the picture, you don't want it to just hunt for focus again. You want it to just take the picture. Right. So being in that MF and having that back button focus, you know, you're able to basically lock in your focus and wait, wait for that moment and then just shoot. I should also mention, you don't have to hold down the joystick button. No, you just click it. You just push it in until the focus is, um, box is green, meaning yep. it's achieved focus, and you let it go. It's not like and then it just holding holds it down. It. Yeah, then it holds that focus. Yeah. So it's, again, it takes a little practice, but to me, back button focus is the way to go. Uh, I, I'm not going to say it's right for everyone all the time. I think it's a very valuable technique to learn, and it will help you get more in-focus pictures. So. Yeah. And the other, the other case, I would say, is for landscape photography, where mm. you're often, let's say you're shooting a sunrise, Okay, you're, you're setting up, if you're going to take a good sunrise photo, you're there 30 minutes before the sunrise. You're on your tripod, you're set up, you're talking with other photographers, but you better be sure you have set your focus because as that sun peaks up over the horizon, you don't want to be fiddling with focus and having it hunt and miss the moment. Right. 
You just want to be snapping pictures as the light's changing right. without the camera trying to reacquire. So having that back button focus, locking in, and then just click, 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 yeah. click, click, and you're there in the moment, That's right. and it's not, you're not risking like, oh no, what did That's I do? That's right, it's not trying to pulse or figure out where. And this is true with any camera. I shot other brands in the old days, mm -hmm. and I've done the same. So back button focus, good. Try it. Um, if there's questions, more questions about that, put it in the comments or email yeah. us, and we can explain further. But There is a question along the lines of that. Um, sure. Mark is asking, is there any way to lock the position of the joystick crosshairs while using the joystick? Oh, boy, no. Um, Unfortunately not. The answer is no. So on the SL601, you did have the ability to choose the number of fields, which are like term termed for focus points. And you could pick one. You could limit it. And then, yes, it would be a center point only, like the S camera. It would be yep. one point in the center. That was it. You could move the joystick. That was that was in our big firmware update. That was a workaround. Yeah. They took that away on the SL2, and there is no way to lock the joystick. You can double tap on the screen, and it will reset the focus point to the center. So that is a workaround for that. It works on the Q2 as well. So again, just on the SL2, uh, let's see your focus point is somewhere in the corner. Double tap the screen. That snaps it. You have to have touch screen enabled. For this. Mm -hmm. uh, that'll snap the focus point back to the middle. But no, there's no way to... I, did, I would love to see this in firmware upgrade. I'll put it out there. If, if anyone would like I was watching, please do this. <laughs> Cause that hey, would guys. Because there is a joystick lock. They added a joystick lock feature. Which yep. is, we're like, oh, this is awesome. The problem right. is... It doesn't lock that. <laughs> if you think of the joystick as five ways, right? Up, down, left, right, in. A five-way switch. In my mind, the ideal functionality would be the joystick lock locks the four ways, so you can't move the point around, but keeps the press active. That's like not as joystick did. lock locks all five ways, so you can't even use the joystick for um, back button focus. Not useful. It's not that useful. So for us, no, for us, you cannot do that at the moment. Um, yes, just be careful and know where your point is, and then double tap on the screen if you need to. Reset. You can also use the uh, touch screen in when you're in EVF mode, mm, yes. and you can actually use your finger, your thumb. So let's say my, my finger's on here. But this can get you in trouble if you tap your nose like I do on the screen and you end up with, uh, so mm -hmm. I actually turn that off. Yeah, smaller nose. I mean, you know, I, I got a guy for that, you know. Yeah. But, uh, the rhinoplasty is not worth it just to use the SL2 touch mode. <laughs> <laughs> tape, wait, tape, That's our tape right here. Board. Next question, Jose, what do we got? All right, so moving on, let's yes. see. Uh, let's talk a little bit about macro functionalities on the SL2. Ooh, Ooh, I, was wanna, wanna amazed, I, I was amazed. I was amazed at the is. feedback that we got from talking about macro in our last couple of oh, videos. Yeah. Apparently, macro is a hot topic. I guess because it's all the thing. It's fun, and you can go crazy, and you can do it with anything, right? And they all, yeah, whatever. Whew, there are so many macro options. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna lead off with with the real, yes. without getting into mac, like pure macro. Mm. We're just gonna say. You can do kind of pseudo macro with the 24 to 90. At 90, uh, the reproduction ratio is what, like 1 to 3 or 1 to 4? Something like that, yeah. It's pretty high. Yeah. Uh, so a lot of my macro photography with the SL, right. macro photography, mm -hmm. uh, is actually with the 24 to 90. And at 90, at F4, like the results are incredible. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so that's actually a possible solution. The other thing is using the... I actually showed you well, pictures of the of the the yarn. Right, but let's because the minimum focus distance is right. close on the 75, 75 and 90. Yes. Yeah. Again, you can get pseudo macro, but it's not real right. macro. There is no Leica SL mount macro lens currently, which means in order to get true macro or near or close to it, you need to adapt something, and you can still stay within the Leica ecosystem. And there's really three, four ways that I can think to do it. Three, the easiest way. Three, which are the least expensive way. Well, well, there's two ways to get it. Two are autofocus, two are manual focus. So let's do it do it that way. Do manual focus first. So the two manual focus options for manual. Okay. Number one, using a Leica R system macro lens. That's Leica's SLR lenses they made for about 50 Oops, years. I popped that off. In this case, David is showing a 60 macro R 2.8. They don't make these anymore. You got to buy them pre-owned. This one's mine. You can't have it. This is a one to two. It's a 60 to eight. It's pretty good. You can also um, see it's a more modern one. It's a ROM. Leica makes. I'm going to hand this to you, David. Here, the R adapter L, which allows you to mount R lenses onto the SL or SL2. That's option one. R lenses. In this case, there's one of two R macros. They also make a 100 to eight macro. That's option one. 
Um, I can also that, show the difference. This is a NovaFlex adapter, yeah. which is also available, but keep in mind the NovaFlex adapter, you'll notice the big difference here. This is just a mechanical dumb adapter. The Leica adapter by comparison, you'll notice has the electronic contacts here. So it actually is going to read the electronic contacts on the R lens, if it has, it's a ROM lens, mm -hmm. and it'll actually communicate that, again, electronically to the camera, so you'll have metadata, it'll know that you're using a 62.8 macro R lens and communicate that to the SL. And it's important to note on the SL2, you need to have a lens profile active for image stabilization to work. And it needs so that. So you have to set it manually otherwise. Okay. Yep. R lenses, they make a macro, R adapter L, on the SL or SL2. Manual focus. That's one solution, manual focus. Second solution is like we talked about last week, using the Leica macro adapter in conjunction with an M lens and the M adapter L. So here are your stacking adapters in this case. We got a few here. So we've got first, you know, yeah, yeah, we go. M lens. First, you do the M lens to the macro adapter. There you go. That makes it a macro lens. This is a 50 Apo in this case. And you could use, of course, the Leica 90 macro M, which I didn't grab. Yep, and you'll notice, right, just like we mentioned in last week's stream, it's sort of a an adjustable extension tube. Yes, and then the M adapter L goes on to the back of the adapter, and now this will mount onto... And, and again, <laughs> just like the R adapter, you'll notice that we have... Whoop, trying to... Yeah, there we go. You'll notice there's the optical 6-bit reader here, and on the flip side, there are electric con electrical contacts to communicate the lens data to the camera. So like In Josh this case, saying, the adapter data. The, the adapter data, yeah. so it'll know it's a macro adapter. Yes. So here we're stacking two adapters. There's no penalty of image quality for this. These are both yeah, there's, just, it's just a hole. hollow tubes. There's no yep. glass there. So that's option two. M lens, macro adapter M, M adapter L, onto the SL. Manual focus, but it does work. Now, those are the two manual focus options. What about if you want autofocus? There are two options for that, both, again, requiring adapters. The first option is using the Leica S120 macro, which David is holding. This is a medium format lens for Leica's S system. David just published a fantastic article that outlines all of the S lenses on Red Dot Forum uh, today, actually. So if you want to learn more about this or other S lenses, check, check out that out. article. Yep. But that's another topic. So the this is a, a one to two macro for the Leica S system. And you can use the Leica S adapter L to mount this onto your SL or SL2. What's cool is the Leica S lenses are, of course, made by Leica. They're autofocused, they have electronic aperture control, they're amazing. Because Leica makes these, they can, of course, reverse engineer the autofocus quite easily. You're missing the diagram. They can reverse engineer the autofocus quite easily Ooh. so that autofocus is maintained when using an S lens on an SL or an SL2. You have autofocus, you have electronic aperture control from the body, and this adapter, because the S lenses are weather sealed, okay? And so is the adapter. The adapter is also weather sealed. It's a gasket right here. So you maintain weather sealing with the S adapter L. What David is holding right now is the only Leica-made autofocus weather sealed macro solution. So autofocus, it, auto aperture. That's right. And not only that, it is a, on an S system, this is a, a 96 millimeter equivalent lens. Mm -hmm. On the SL, because there is no crop, it's full frame, it is a 120 millimeter macro lens, f2.5. That's right. This, this is, is crazy. And it's as sharp at 2.5, wide open, as most other manufacturers' lenses at f8. This is... Yeah, this is the most fun This is, in my opinion. Awesome. Because if this is actually, if I'm going to get even more crazy, it is the only Leica-made mm -hmm. autofocus, electronic aperture control, full frame, yep. weather-sealed way to get macro. Yeah, it's sweet. That was a lot of things, but you can replay that. And... And just to show you, it's not that big. It's really, I mean, this is with an adapter on it, but it's really not much bigger than than a standard. Yeah, it feels SL just lens. like an SL. Yeah, here, lens. Here's a 24 to 90. Yeah, it's really not. That's a 50. That's a 50. <laughs> this is a 24 to 90. Here we go. Um, so this is a really, really cool solution. It's about the same size. There's a lot of S lenses available pre-owned out there. They make a fantastic lens solution on the SL because they are autofocus and weather sealed enough. Now. I said there was two ways to get autofocus, but you'll notice I mentioned that the S lens was the only way to get full frame. So Leica makes lenses for the TL2 and CL. They are APS-C lenses, so they're designed to cover a 1.5x crop factor. And they are autofocus, and they're excellent. And for the APS-C system, they make a 60 millimeter 2.8 macro. Now you'll notice that this is just like there's an R, 
62A macro. So there's some sort of family lineage here. There's a big difference between these two lenses aside from the fact that one is full frame oh, yeah. and one is not. This is the only one-to-one -one macro lens Leica has ever made that does it without any kind of adapters or extenders. For any camera system. Anything. Ever. 106 years of Leica history. Ever. I mean, I, I hate saying these absolute statements because someone will comment like, well, that's not in the, true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, let's just say. The Navy commissioned in, 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 the, in, the, in 1958. In the, in the modern era of relevant things that you and I can use readily, yep. the 62.8 Elmer TL. Apo. Apo Elmer TL. Made in Germany. So nice. What's cool is this will mount on the SL with no adapter because it is an L mount lens. So, oh, and it's feather light also. Super light. So it mounts on the SL, the SL2. No adapter needed. Native. You get one to one macro. It's equivalent to a 90. The downside, if you will, is that because this is an APS C lens, it crops the, a the SL's full frame sensor down to an APS C size. But the SL, <laughs> you get a 10 megapixel file. The SL601. The SL601. You get a 10 megapixel file crop mm -hmm. by 50%. So, Usable for smaller prints or social media or e-commerce or anything like that. However, on the SL2, this becomes a 20 megapixel file, mm -hmm. which is just about the same resolution as the original SL was. Or the was CL, no, which or the, is the lens made right, for. Yeah. Or the CL or the TL2, which is more than enough resolution to make 20 by 30 prints. Sure. Especially because this lens is so darn sharp. Oh my gosh, yeah. This lens was designed to resolve on smaller pixels, right? So it was created for the CL system, which again, the CL with an APS sensor is 24 megapixel. These pixels at 20 megapixels mm -hmm. for the same size mm -hmm. are actually slightly bigger. Mm. Yes. This lens has no problem resolving on the SL2 sensor. And uh, you get image stabilization too. That's true. Well, that's that's what's cool about all of these, these adaptive yeah. solutions. Yeah, the S, the, is, SL, on the SL2 is they're all going to be stabilized. So. Even this. Um, it's still very useful on the SL, but the SL2 you get that perk of, of stabilization. So those are the four Leica you know, staying within the world of like a ways to get macro on the SL or the SL2. That was a long explanation. That being said, <laughs> no, no, if Leica is listening, uh -huh. and I know you are, uh -huh. we really, really, really want an Apo Macro native Oof, SL lens. So cool! Like just a, take the 120s lens and then reconfigure it for an Apo. Maybe I'm thinking like well, I don't know because the, the SL Apo mm. SL Summicrons are so nice. It's like, would it be worth it to make another? I'll tell you what. If you want Leica to make. A lens. Make a comment. Comment on this video so we know how many people actually would use it because I'm actually now curious about that. And so like is like, well, how many people? Like, yeah. like, macro seems to be like the hot thing right now. Yeah. So, um, well, everyone's taking pictures of close ups in their kitchen and living room. Right. So, yeah. all right, that was a good question. And uh, hopefully, my answer, despite its long windedness, was effective. So, I what think, what do we I have think next? it was thorough. I would like you. What's well, next? Good job, Jeff. Yeah. Now that we're speaking of alternative lenses, um, Maurice was asking, how is the performance of our lenses on the SL, and are there any specific lenses to avoid? Ooh, that's a loaded question. Uh, David, you take that one. You take. You start with it. I'll run with it. Okay. Uh, I. I mean, I have. Where'd it go? I have a couple R lenses myself. I was a big R shooter. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I was a big R shooter uh, with the R8, R9, the DMR, uh, and the only lenses that I actually kept were the 60 to 8 macro. The 100 Apo Macro, Elmerit, which I have, mm -hmm. we just didn't have any room on the table. That's right. And... The 180. Did I bring the 180? No, it's in the cabinet. It's oh, no, it's here. Oh, never mind. Uh, I also have this, which is a 180 uh, Apo, Apo Tellet Elmerit, I think? Tell it, tell it. This, this, that's, you're this is an Apo Elmerit 180 2.8. Yeah, Apo Elmerit R. Okay, yeah. so this is a 180 2.8. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it actually is pretty compact, uh, especially if you want to use an R adapter on it. Our adapter L. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of nice if you need a little bit more reach, but it's actually smaller diameter certainly than a uh, than a native SL lens. So it, it's not too bad for the amount of reach that you get. It's right. double what you get on the 24 to 90, and it is a really sharp lens. What threw me though is the fact that, and this is maybe this is to answer the question, right? Which is to say that. This is widely considered one of the absolute sharpest R lenses ever made. Yes. I'd say this, the 280 f4, uh, the 35 to 70. There, there's a number of really good right. R lenses. For, like, for a long time, these lenses had this in, like the in, standard. The cult following, they were right. the gold standard until. Until. 
when I was doing, and I recommend you check out my 90 to 280 review, mm -hmm. I compared it against my lovely Here's a 1828 Apo Elmerit. And obviously this is a lot smaller. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to yeah. put it over there. A little bit there. A little bit. So I really was like, okay, this Zoom, I know it's good, but it, is it as good as my 180 Apo? That's right. I mean, probably not, but let's be fair, right? So I went out, I did some super boring, like, you know, brick wall fence tests, you know, flat field. Uh, I, I focused every single one at 100% on the camera, on a tripod, self timer, the whole thing. And I looked at the results, I said something had to be wrong because the zoom is sharper than the 180 by a lot. Right. I must have screwed up, I must have messed up. So I got back in my car, drove back out to another location, found another wall, did my whole series of tests again, extra careful on the focusing, came back, looked at the files, it was not a mistake. The 90-28 just obliterated yeah. the 180 Apo. It's insane. Like, again, this is a lens that the 180 that was... This was like amazing. You wouldn't think anything could get better than it. No. I mean, it was just some, and it's still a good lens today. It's great. It's just not as good as that. So, <laughs> so you know, using our lenses on the SL and especially the SL2 is, a, is more of a stopgap. If you have a bunch of them already, use Great. them. They're fun. But I wouldn't go out and buy a bunch of our lenses unless they were lenses that didn't exist in the SL system, like a macro, or if you wanted a compact 180 tele. I mean, there are obviously use cases for everything. Um, and a lot of them are good, or I hate to say good, but better investments than most because they are rare and they don't make them anymore. Like the 35.7. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. They're not out. Though. So, But from a practical standpoint of, you know, all things being equal, is image quality the same? No. Even the best R lenses are not as good as SL lenses. I mean, and that yeah. that should be pretty obvious. I mean, they were designed 30, 40 years ago, right. and they were the best at the time. But they were also designed in a film era, and the SL lenses were designed with a much higher uh, yeah. design spec. They're they're designed to resolve just so much more detail, and the processes that Leica has now, and the technology they have is so much more precise than what they had 20, 30 years and ago. I, I do want to say that obviously not everything is about, you know, the, the about sharpest, the yeah. best. It's, I, I get that because we're all looking for something different. Well, that's why I still have this. Right, because that's still fun. And stop down, things change as well. We're talking wide open or near it, but... Wide open, this is, you know, like when it super comes, soft in the corners, yes. but it's okay because it actually looks really pretty. Yeah, it's for fun. It's something work. different. Yeah. So it's not... In terms of absolute performance, the SL lenses will crush any R lens, but... Even there, the zooms. There are still some really fun options in the R ecosystem. There's tons of them out there. They've been making them for years, since the 60s. So Yeah, some of my um, favorites, the the 19 Elmeret. Ooh, yeah, version 2. But the 1635 is better. Way better. OK. Uh, the 28 Elmeret, which is actually a really fun lens because it's super uh, compact. It's mm -hmm. really, I don't have one here, but it, it's really small. Yeah. Uh, so that's a good walk around 28. But I, I would be more inclined to use like the 23 TL lens, yeah, uh, or whatever. I mean, it or the 24 Summicron when it right, comes right, out. Right. Uh, you have the 35 Summicron R lens was also really good, but not anywhere in the same ballpark as the new 35 Cron. Again, right. okay, I want to bash yeah, R lenses. It's sort you know, of like, like, and if you've got them, you pick use them. them. If you've got a bunch of R lenses. Get the adapter, even if you just get the Nova Flex adapter, and you're gonna have some fun. Um, well, I just we were playing with a 282.8 the other day. Oh yeah. And there's nothing like that in the SL Big. world, right? So you put a two, you get a 282.8. That lens is so much fun. It's gonna give you a totally different look, and there's nothing that like it makes because well, this is. And if you four. put that 1.4 matching teleconverter, yeah, it's a four. Out of four yeah, right? so, super cool. Yeah, there's a lot of really cool options, and again, they've proven to be you know, pretty stable value wise as well. So you go can, to town. You can get it. Yeah. Try it. Yeah. You don't like it. Yeah. Sell it, and That's you're right. in and out of it for the same. They've been. I mean, I think after 30 years, the value yeah, is pretty well right. stabilized. Next question. All right. So we have, we have a quick question here. They're asking about the silver lens mm. that's on the table. What is it? This is mine. No, this is a. <laughs> I, I do actually want the black version, right? I have the black one. This is a Sumalux TL 35 millimeter f 1.4 mm. in the same vein as the 60 macro I showed you earlier, the uh, crop sensor lens. Tasty. This is designed for the TL and CL cameras. Um, it's an L-mount lens, so it fits on the SL or the SL2 natively. No adapter is required. And it will autofocus, of course. Um, of course, you are cropping down. On the SL2, you've got 20 megapixels. So this is a 51.4 autofocus 
20 megapixel lens Compact. on the SL2. It's insanely small. I'll actually pop it on there so we can see. And not only that, it's light. Uh, I, I use this quite a lot for video work mm. on the SL mm -hmm. because, uh, especially in the on the first SL, so on the first SL 601, uh, to shoot 4K video, you had to shoot in Super 35, which is basically the same as APS. And this lens was just an incredible video lens uh, because you could shoot it wide open. It looked amazing, very cinematic. It also focuses super close to a third of a meter, mm -hmm. which is something you don't get on the M equivalent. Right. Uh, I'd say this is actually, at least for that, better than the 35 m which yeah. we already established in the last video is one of our favorite lenses. Plus, you can get this in silver. It looks super cool on there. Um, okay, it comes in black, too. Yeah, you can get it in black. But that's a, that mm. was a long answer to a short question. So that is what that is. 35 TL, in, in this case, in silver, they make it in black. Next question. All right. So you have a few questions about flash settings on the SL2. Oh, boy. TTL. Yeah, there's no built-in flash on the SL. Moving on. <laughs> Leica uh, makes. Yeah, you can use Profoto. You want to take this, Josh? Well, I don't do a lot of flash photography, but I deal with a lot of individuals that do. There is no native Profoto support yet um, for the SL2. I don't know if that's something we'll ever see. Um, everything has to be manual, so there's no TTL. The only way to get TTL is with a Leica SF60 or SF40 or SF64, I think. Um, it works fine. I don't use that much. If I do, it's going to be TTL with exposure compensation or manual flash. Um, the low light performance of the SL and the SL2 is so good. You know, I don't know. If Christian was here, he would, uh, the wedding mm. tutor, he would tell us. Uh, that's, a, that's an article for Red Dot Forum, I think. It's Just shoot available light. No, I don't want to put down anyone who wants to try flash. I think the SF60 is a great option because mm -hmm. it's compact, it's powerful, it's got manual control. You can control it wirelessly with the SFC1. Um, it still stays within the like ecosystem. Um, but I, if I'm going to use a flash on camera, I usually use it as a fill, rarely as a main. So I'll balance my available light and drag my shutter a little bit to get some light from the flash. So that's as much as I'm going to say about it because I'm not an expert in flash. So um, yeah. I'll but it, it does not have Profoto Air built in. It does not have Pocket Wizard built in. Correct, yeah. These are frequently requested things that we hear, both of us. Uh, if you really want it, let like a know you really want it. Um, because I don't think they're going to do it unless they think that there's enough interest. All right, good question, though. Yeah. Next. All right, guys, let's take just a couple of minutes to um, announce the winner of the Ooh. trivia question. Are we announcing that now? Are we just going to do an announcement? Is that how we're doing it? What do we got? You have a winner picked out? Yeah, we do. You do? Okay. Why don't, why don't, uh, why don't you do that, David? Okay. So the winner of our wait, super wait. cool swag. Drum roll? No, just, just the no, winner of our roll. super cool swag. If you missed it earlier, where you're giving away a Red Dot 4, or Red Dot Wear uh, thermos shirt and pin, a little swag bag to the person, one of the people who guessed correctly. The you should get a close up here, Jose. Trivia question from the last video. Uh, and the winner is... Hold on, hold on, hold on. we got to show what they're winning. So it's a really cool SL, don't, SL don't pin. Don't drag it out. Don't, don't be that guy. All right, and? Got the shirt. The really pocket cool. Tea. Pocket tee. Very cool. Okay. And the thermos. David and Clinton. the thermos. I'd like to announce the winner of this I'm awesome going to announce the winner. Priceless swag. The winner is Marv Miller. And the correct answer, so the question was... What notable individual stacked three of these macro adapters, M's, with a 50 Simulux, or 50 Noctilux, rather, to take macro photography in the woods? And the answer is, let's see, can we do it? Where is he? Where is he? It's supposed to be over here somewhere. <laughs> it must be floating between <laughs> the two of us in this amorphous space. And, and go. go. Magical. And go. Yes, Yay! <laughs> okay. So the answer is Mr. Peter Carba. The legendary. The legendary, the one, the only, the head of optics at Leica, who actually is responsible for a lot of the amazing glass on this table. He's designed some of the most legendary R lenses, uh, S lenses, SL lenses, M lenses. He is... Uh, He's the man. He is the man. So, so, so Peter Carba is also happens to be a photographer and really into macro photography, which is why we need to bug him to make a macro lens for the <laughs> SL. But right. congratulations, Marv. Uh, thanks, and congratulations. We will contact you to get your swag bag sent off. All right. Very nice. 
And tune right. in uh, next week, and we'll do another giveaway. I'm yeah. Assuming, right? so yeah, we'll come up with some fun. Maybe we'll give away an SLT. No, I'm kidding. We're not going to. We're not going to give away an SLT. <laughs> uh, yeah. Right, I've got one right here. Give it away. All right, next question. Next, well, that wasn't right. really a question, but good. okay. All right, thanks. So, how do you guys find the new button arrangement on the SO2 compared to the four button setup on the original mm -hmm. SL? Why don't you show, and then we'll tell. Sure, we're gonna show and tell. Oh, Ooh, I need. Oh, that's dirty, dirty. Oh, use a lens cloth. All right, all right. So let me show you the SL601 first. Let me clean it. And this is what we call kind of the four soft button interface. We do a close up there. There we go. Get some stuff out of the way here. Uh, there we go. All right, and the way that works, did I take the battery out of here? Yes. Sorry. Sharing a battery, one second. Oh, here, you can use this one. Now, nah, good. We got batteries. We got batteries. We got all the batteries. Okay. So you'll see that these are, uh, there we go, some soft keys. And if I press, okay, that brings up a menu. But if you long press, meaning push and hold, I think I have to be in shooting mode. If I long press, see it brings up controls. And on this case, it is the, I think there's ISO showing, mm -hmm. right? So these are all assignable. So push and hold, that brought up the menu. Right, so show up, okay, we get right. that. Show you get that, yeah. right? So this is the, the four button interface and you can customize these under the customized control menu. Correct. Now, SL2. the SL2, by comparison, use this battery. Oh, that's right. I brought you one. Thanks. I got, you, I got you back. Thanks, man. No problem. All right. The SL2 goes to what we call kind of the unified three button interface. And these are actually labeled over here. So you see uh, play, live view, and menu. Uh, it still has the same, whoop, same joystick, still got an uh, EVF activation button still have the scroll wheel, which is also a button itself. So the scroll wheel pushes in and the... So you can see the SL. Yep, and, the, and the joystick there also comparison. pushes in. So a lot of that stayed the same. We also have the... Um, oh, there we go. We also have the two buttons on the top and the scroll wheel. So a lot of the stuff has stayed the same. Right. But the back oh, is totally different. And, and this has also changed. Take so on, you'll see here... So you can see it better now? Uh, yeah, let me take the lens off. There we go. So you'll see here that we have, oh, I'm covering it with my finger. Uh, we have the, the two buttons on the front rather than on the SL601. There was just the, the single uh, button right there. Okay, so they've, they've split that. Now, on the, on the SL2, uh, what I do like about it is there's a lot of customization. Even though you think that they've reduced the number of buttons, what I what I like is that this function button here, this button here that defaults to EVF is also assignable. So assignable function, assignable function, assignable function, assignable function, and then on the front, uh, both of these are also assignable each to a function. So that's two buttons. It's one physical piece of material. Yeah, but there's there's two here. Yeah, it's two buttons. It's split. Yeah. And what I really like about this is on the old one, you'd have to dig through the menus to do your button assignment. What's really cool here is, let's say I want to assign my function button. If I just push and hold, I can select what I want that behavior to be and select it. And then the next time I just tap it, it brings up that menu. And that's the same for all of these buttons. So if I push and hold on the top, okay, I can assign this to whatever I want. Select it, and then... All right, so it's no longer a press and hold to activate, which I, you know, it works fine, but I, I like the sl 2s interface a little better. It's a little smoother and faster. Yeah, it's faster, it's smoother, it's just, it makes more sense. You get used to it. And I love, love, with a capital L, I love the new touch, that's up there. I love the touch screen interface here. The quick menu. The you. quick menu is awesome. So being able to tap this, and you can also, you can use the joystick to get around. Uh, or you can just tap it. Yeah. So, so that is so cool, especially because like if you're out shooting landscape, you have all of your main controls accessible and visible uh, right on the rear screen, which is great. And it brings the camera in line with the M10, the CL, and now all of Leica's models that are current, um, aside from the S3, uh, have this interface. And yeah. you know, if you have an M10 and an SL2, you can go between them seamlessly and not be like, wait, what was it? It's actually pretty intuitive. So. 
Just yeah. takes a little bit of... Because I, I shoot the CL a lot, yeah. and this is just like the CL with more function buttons. Yep, yeah, pretty much. All right, next question. Awesome. I like it. Good question. So another user interface question from Richard. He's asking, does the SL and the SL2 have the depth of field scale on the upper screen like the S007? Yes. Can we get close enough for this? I don't even yeah. know. Yeah. I'm going to throw a wide angle lens on so I can actually demonstrate a little better. The 1635 right here. Got it. 1635 is great use of this. I use this all the time. This right. is one of my favorite features. Because you'll notice there's no, there's no distance scale on the lens. On the lens. There's no focus distance scale on the lens. Let's, I'm going to preface David's explanation with that. OK, but let's say that I'm going to actually shoot some landscape. OK, and we're going to dial in to f11 here. OK, so you see on the top display, maybe you don't, f11, trying to get the good angle there. You gotta turn it upside, turn it the other way, don't you? There we go. Hey, that makes a lot more yes. sense. Okay, so you see that it says F11 on the display here. Uh, I am actually gonna set this to manual focus. All right, it has to be in manual focus mode, MF mode, for this to work. Give me a second. Okay, so I'm in manual focus now. And if I half press, okay, there is a depth of field scale. And you can see the numbers moving now. I am gonna, hold on. Scoot over here, because i got to see it. OK. All right. You can take your time. Yeah, don't worry about me. <laughs> I'm all good. It's worth it, I promise, to everyone watching and wondering, what is he doing? OK. So what you'll see there is, if I push and hold, I've got 0.4 feet on the, the front, right, which is right there, front. I don't care about what the focus number is. And then on the back, it says infinity. So what this is telling me is that everything from like super, super close all the way to infinity is going to be sharp and in focus and be within depth of field. And again, going back to what Josh was saying about decoupling the, um, the shutter release from focus is I can just shoot and shoot and shoot and there is no problem yeah. with it refocusing and getting rid of that focus calibration. So let's just, calibration. again, explain. The SL and the SL2 both do this. Yep. They have to be in MF mode. So the focus mode has to be MF. It can't be AFS or AFC. Once the camera is put into MF mode, as soon as you have pressed the shutter, you don't have to do anything else. There's no other setting. As soon as you have pressed the shutter, on the bottom, underneath where it says M and 11, you have front, what is it, front, focus, and back? Yep. And that's going to show you the depth of field. So the front is the near part of the depth of field. The focus is the actual distance the lens is focused to. And back is the far end of the depth of field. Right. This is the range. So if you were shooting with a macro, you may see like very, you know, very one small. inch to 1.2 inches to 1.4 inches. It may be some ludicrously small range. Yep. Uh, but still very handy in guiding you to ensure that everything is in focus. We can probably do a whole video just on using that. Um, I don't want to, it's, and it's a little hard to show with, without getting closer, but it's, it's, it's a amazing. game changer. This yeah. is so yes. amazing because everyone asks, like, oh, how do you get these shots where everything's right. in focus? Well, I do it by number. It's yeah. like it's like a coloring book. Yeah. Except Color, focus by number. Focus by That's number. It. It's pretty cool. I let the camera do the, the calculation for me, and I basically am shooting at f11, and that's a whole other discussion, but <laughs> Please, for my sake, don't stop down past f11 on the SL2 unless you like softer pictures, uh, because physics. And yeah, I can, especially with the 1635, at 16 I get like massive depth of field. But if you're just auto-focusing to infinity, you're going to throw away a lot of that front focus. You're not going to get focus all the way to your feet. Right. It's not an efficient way. This is the most efficient way to maximize depth of field so that what you want to be in focus is in focus. Which is everything. That's, in this case. Yeah, which that's is everything. what we're getting at. Here, so. But every focal length, and you'll, I don't know if you saw that when I was changing it, but as you're zooming... It's too hard to see on a little screen. Anyway. Right, but as you're changing the zoom even subtly, or as you change aperture, those numbers are updating in real time. Correct. So you do have to keep an eye on that. If you if you pop, you know, it's like, oh, this isn't six, good 16, I'm going to shoot it at 19. Right. you got to readjust your focus because it will change. Definitely play with this. But again, got to be in MF mode. MF mode, right. and make sure to half press the shutter. And you'll see it. To see it. As soon as you let go, you that display it. disappears. All right, next question. That was awesome. 
Awesome. Great question. We actually have a follow-up question on the uh, back button autofocus. All right, follow right. Oh, John you do is asking, can one set up back button autofocus uh, with continuous? Focus? Oh, of course yes. they ask yes, me you that. Can. Of you course can. you can. I was just like, I got to dive into the menu to show you that. You can. There's a menu option. You want to show uh, on that one? That's the SL. You, you want to show them on, on the two because you got it there? Or? Yeah, I'll show it. Because it's a little different, but it's the same. Essentially, there is a custom function to change the joystick button during back button focus from its default, which is AFS for single, meaning press release focus, to AFC, meaning you press and hold the joystick button, and as long as you're holding that button down, it's continuously focusing on whatever you're shooting. So it's a rare use case, and what's really important to understand is that once you change that, it stays there until you change it back. I know that sounds obvious, but you may forget, and then you'll just go out and start pressing it once and releasing it like you did when it was an AFC, and you're going to miss a lot of shots because it's going to be constantly hunting for focus as it is designed to do, you know, looking and checking and tracking versus just locking focus. So hmm. um, it is, it's in the... Um, Not in touch AF. No, it's in the... Is it a focus setup? They I'm moved it, of course, from the, uh, the uh, like over here in the red In, in fairness, it's not something I actually <laughs> access because, <laughs> yeah. You know, I'll get there. Yeah. Uh, David never... Because this just shows you my point exactly, which is how rarely we change it to AFC. What I'll do while David finds this is in the moments when I need to use AFC, instead of changing the behavior of the joystick button, I there actually put it from AFS or from MF to I'm gonna, AFC. I'm going to show exactly where it is. Okay. All right. So let's, it's, it's a little hidden here. So what we're showing again, just before David gets into this, is how to use the back button, the joystick button, in MF mode to autofocus with autofocus continuous, also known as AFC. Right. Go. So you'll see under Customize Control. That's, yep. Under Joystick. And then here you'll see MF mode. And it says AF. S, if you toggle it, whoop. yeah, you're good. Yep, AFS, or you can do also AFS auto exposure lock or AFC. I've got here. So what this menu is showing is the behavior of the joystick button when you're in MF mode. Go, go back out to the main menu so they can see that one more time, David. Whoop. Everything's backwards. Yeah, I know. Okay, there we go. So on the fourth, third page of the menu. I think. Yep. Yeah, you can see at the top it gives you a little index. Right, so right third there. page of the main menu. Customize control, yep. you go into that by pressing the joystick again. Go to the joystick function, and you'll see it has AF and MF mode. This makes sense, because we want to talk about what it does in MF mode. Go to MF mode, and then we can put it from, you'll see default as AFS, we can switch it over to AFC. So customize control, joystick, MF mode, AFC. A little long-winded, but now you see why I don't change it that much, because right. it is a And what's really confusing, and the reason I was hunting a little bit, is I believe it should be in... Focus setup, which is right, yeah, that's AF mode, but also in, where is it? Uh, oh, sorry, main menu, okay. I believe it should be in the second item, which is focusing, which has a lot of focus options. Why it doesn't, I don't know. I think it's because it's tied to the control, not right. to the focus. And it's also mode. because it does more than just focus. You can describe auto True, exactly. And some other stuff. It's a little so complicated. It, it, this is more of like an advanced feature, uh, which is why I was like, okay, I'll show you. But um, yeah. now you know. And you just play this video back 50 times and, <laughs> and you'll find it. You'll find it. You'll find so, it. Maybe. Good, that's a good question, though, because it's a valid question. Mm -hmm. We got time for a few more questions, so let's keep. Uh, hey, what do you got, Jose? Yeah. Uh, what about M lenses on SL? We, we mentioned that. Yeah, so um, the M adapter L. Performance. Oh, performance. Mm. Uh, oh, boy. How much time we got? Um, Complicated. We, uh, we can cover this in like part two more and more in depth, yeah. but I do want to answer this. Uh, David. No, no, you go ahead. Yeah, well, go okay, ahead. so Leica makes the M adapter L. It comes in black and it comes in silver, right? That allows you to mount M mount lenses onto the SL, SL2, TL, TL2CL, any L mount camera or any other L mount. Yep, so... Now, of okay. course, you've got 76 years of... Or something like that. Uh, 60, 67, 66 yeah. years, sorry. Of M lenses to choose from, just like you do if you have an M camera. The question is, what is the benefits, pitfalls, whatever, of using an M lens on and, the cell? And I should... That's exactly what popped up on my screen. Mm -hmm. Can you guys see that? I hope so. Maybe? Maybe, maybe, maybe? So it says lens detected. Uh... Aposumicron M50, which is correct. So it does correctly identify it. And why is that important, Josh? 
Well, that's important because the camera needs to have a lens profile assigned in order for image stabilization to work. So that's the big one. But anyway, you can mount any M lens you want pretty much using the M adapter L on the SL or the SLT. The main benefit, aside from the fact that it can be fun, is they're small, really small. So it makes the camera way, way, way smaller with an M lens. You also have access to tons of cool stuff. Mm -hmm. I grabbed here. I'm oh, yeah. You put this on. This is the that 75. Nice. This is the most fun lens to use on the SL2. Hands down, bar none, 75 Noctilux. Especially for video. Because it's sharp enough. <laughs> I to say that. It's sharp enough to be amazing on 47 megapixels. It's a Ooh. modern lens. It's only a few years old. It balances really nice. Stabilized. You can use the amazing EVF to dial in your precise focus. Actually, this is more fun on an SL2 than on an M. I said. Yeah, for there, sure. There, I said it. It's out there now forever. So. To use older lenses on the SL or the SL2, you're doing it because you want a vintage look, you want some of the aberration, you want some of the flaws, I get that. But any SL lens is going to do a better job than any M lens in terms of absolute image quality. I think the 75 SL and the 75 Noctilux compared, I just did that recently, and they were very, very close. Very different renderings, so it's hard to say one is They're better than the so other. They're both so sharp. They're though. both so good. Yeah. If you don't care about autofocus, you know, whatever, it's fine. But I would say I wouldn't probably go out and buy a bunch of M lenses to use on the SL2 unless you really wanted to have fun with that because you are giving up autofocus and weather sealing and electronic aperture control. But if you have M lenses, they are a lot of fun to use on the SL2. You can tap the joystick in once, instantly zoom to 100%, dial in your focus. You can use focus peaking as well, and then tap again, or half press the shutter, clears out. So yeah, they're fun. I would encourage you to experiment if you've got them already. I guess the short answer is, if you have an SL or an SL2, and you have M lenses, also. you are missing out if you don't have at least the M adapter. Yeah. That's it. You're missing out. Good question. Awesome. All right. Can you guys talk a little bit about um, SD cards and which ones are recommended? Oh, sure. Yeah. Come up, yes. I happen to have one right here. We have so, we're so well prepared. Look at this. So this is what I'm using right now. I can just show you. Uh, the SL does take both the SL 601 and the SL2 have two card slots. Uh, one of the upgrades on the SL2 was the fact that uh, on the original SL, the first slot was UHS-2, but the second slot was UHS-1. On the SL2, both slots are now UHS-2, which is very fast, it's up to 300 mega second. Uh, the cards I like, da -da 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 -da, drum roll, uh, is this one. Which, <laughs> people are gonna like screenshot this. Just what is this? Go. No, here, I have a bigger one. Oh, here we go. There we go. Uh, there for a second. I feel I feel like a late night show. <laughs> okay, and this card here is available today. Let, let's show from your new movie. Uh, so I like these. I think bang for the buck. Uh, first of all, the SL2 files are massively large. So I'm going for a 256 gig card here. On the original SL, I shot 64 gig cards. These files are noticeably larger, so I definitely need the extra space. And this one is a 1,667X card. It's a lot of Xs. It's a lot of Xs with write speeds up to 250 megabytes per second. I can't remember the exact price of these. Uh, it changes every day. Anyway. It changes. I don't know. They're, they're affordable. I think it's under $100. By comparison, if you ask me what the absolute best card is to use on the SL2, especially if you're going to do video, is the, um, the Sony Tough series, which is a 300 meg per second card, read and write. They only come up to 128 gigabytes, but the 128 gig card is, um, I don't know, a lot? Like 200 and some dollars. And again, this changes every day. Uh, yeah. And if you watch this video in 10 years, it's probably gonna be like four cents, but. Yeah. But yeah, so these cards are a fraction of the price. Yeah, these are sweet. Double the capacity, but not necessarily as good for shooting video. You can shoot video, but it's not ideal. Uh, this little number here. Oh, you're not going to see that. Well, I'm going to try. So there's a number here that says V60. Uh, V60 is the rating for video of continuous stream quality. It's like 60 megabytes per second. Uh, multiplied by eight, that's 480 megabits per second, which is usually what the cameras talk about. I know it's super confusing. Um, the Sony Tough cards are V90, so 90 megabytes per second, guaranteed, minimum. Uh, even some of the fastest Le or, uh, SanDisk cards that, that we've historically had, uh, that, that like I know Josh really likes those, they're only V30, 
So even though they're like 280 megabyte per second cards, mm -hmm. they're super fast, mm -hmm. they're not really meant for video. So it's, I don't do a lot of video, so that's... He doesn't do video. David is the video guy, so... There we go. It's complicated. Mm -hmm. I recommend 128 or 256. I recommend a fast card if you don't want to be waiting a huge amount of time. And definitely look for UHS-2. That would be my recommendation. Let's do... It's we got a little time. Let's do a few questions. Maybe a couple of shorter ones, if we have any. Yeah, and just to let everybody know, we are going to do a part two of the SL. Mm -hmm. so I'm thinking so, yeah. 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 I, I, have I a lot of questions. you we were going to have to do a part two. <laughs> We do have a lot of questions. You know, we so if we don't get to your question down, tonight, so don't worry. Don't worry if, you watched, get there. if you watched part two of the M10, you'll notice we answered a lot of the unanswered questions from the last week. Yep. So don't hesitate to keep asking questions here because we will get to them to the best of our ability next time we do. So. But between then, now, and then, mm -hmm. you should definitely read all of those resources down below. Every single one. Because then you'll don't, be able to teach us a thing or two. There will be a quiz, I assure you. There's no quiz. Yes. Let's go with another one here. Um, Brian is asking, do you think Leica will make any native 0.95 aperture lenses for the L mount with autofocus? No. I don't think so. You know how big that would be? They would be massively large. Yeah, to give you an idea, this is a 50 millimeter 1.5 native. 1.4. Well, so did you call it 1.5? I did. Ooh, that's it's video late. 1.4, <laughs> 50 millimeter 1.4 Similux. This is massively large. For let's let's not bash this lens too much because this lens is awesome. But it's huge. It's big for a fifty one four. Yes. I don't have the fifty lux M lens here, no. but just for comparison purposes. It's a well baby, but it's a good lens. They're it's both fifty millimeter super lenses. Super sharp. That's sharper than the fifty apo M. Right. But imagine yeah. this lens a in a point nine five. It'd be huge. You need like. It'd also be like twenty grand probably. It would come with a free assistant to I mean, carry here's it. The re here's the reality. Oh my gosh. Like a. When they're making a fast aperture autofocus lens, it has to be dead on accurate at all distances, wide open. The less depth of field you have, the exponentially more difficult it becomes to ensure the autofocus is accurate, which mm -hmm. means the focus gets slower, mm -hmm. and the lens gets larger. So with so little depth of field at 0.95, the size of the lens from a mechanical standpoint, in order to ensure the autofocus is accurate, it would be impractical. Right. I mean, look, I have a dream list of stuff too, but I just don't think that would make a lot of sense. Um, but it like is a, easy enough to yes. adapt yeah. an M lens that is super fast. If you want to have really fun with autofocus, get the 100 millimeter F2 S lens. Oh, yeah. Put it on the S adapter L, and that's Ooh. 100 F2, which is sweet. That lens, yeah, is, yeah, yeah. that lens is really, really cool. I mean, um, that is, I even call it that myself, the Noctilux of the S system. Yeah. So it's, that's kind of a cool. Um, it gets auto focus and you're not giving up anything. Uh, and weather ceiling. And it's not that big either. So. Uh, no, it's smaller than the 120. Yeah. Here we go. And it's half a stop faster. Right, and let's do cool. like two more good questions if we got them. Well, first of all, I know everyone wants to see the dog as always. Oh, do we have to do Enzo? And he's asleep. Yes. He's, he's sleeping. He was having his little dreams before he was, like, he was running. His little feet. Yeah. I wish you could see how cute he is. He's down here. Come here, buddy. Come here. What's that? What? Who's that? Up there? Who's that? He's Look. like halfway there. He looks. Yeah, he he's looks very, a little he's very sleepy. Now he's just mad at me for waking him up. Can we just here. Can we just let me just get him. Let me get him. Okay. Huh? Prepare for Enzo, everybody. Here we go. Let me let me clear a path. Let me clear a path. My little face. I see your little face. Yay! I like last time we got cheated. We got cheated. Oh, nope, other way. So sleepy. Other way. Um, there you go. Wait, put, wait, him, wait, put him. Put him over here. It? Put him over here. Okay. There he is. There he oh. is. <laughs> no. The amount of work. The amount of work we have to do. Hey! This is Enzo, if you don't know already. He's my buddy. He's going to be seven in May. He's a golden retriever. Hi. Oh. He likes uh, long walks in the park <laughs> and lots of foods. You can see he's treats. quite sleepy. This is past his bedtime. He likes treats. Oh, he's a good boy, though. He's, he's, he's been here the whole time, just sleeping, chilling, doing good dog stuff. Oh. If you ever come to the Leica store, he's always there with me. <laughs> Shedding everywhere, licking things. <laughs> oh, All right, go back okay. to bed. Go back to okay, bed. Okay, buddy. He'll hang out with us for a bit. Probably, yeah. So. All right. We can go back. All right, Kirsten, are you happy now? Here's Enzo for you. Okay. So that's the only reason I did it. Okay, back to the good stuff. Here, I'll move. I'll move that so you can see the dog. There you go. How's that? Better. Right, Jose, I'm sorry. All right. I interrupted you. There we go. There you go. All right. So. Next question. Let's see. What about silent shutter? Um, Ooh, that is a good question. Tell you. 
Well, you don't want to answer that one? Okay, you just a silent shutter. <laughs> well, great answer. So, the SL and the SL2 both incorporate an electronic shutter, which mm -hmm. is totally silent. Mm -hmm. The electronic shutter was added in SL firmware 3.0. Mm -hmm. So it That's was a actually one. a feature they added mid-life. It wasn't something that the camera came with from the factory. And it allows you to shoot, instead of using the mechanical shutter, which is a physical piece of material that moves across the sensor, it... Carbon fiber composite. It basically just turns the sensor on and off. So there's no noise. I mean, it's literally silent. Like like what you'd have if you took a picture on your phone. Right, exactly. Uh, where the dog is. Without the simulated like shutter sound. So the advantage is, of course, it's totally silent. If you're shooting a wedding ceremony or mm -hmm. in a courtroom or some environment where it's frowned upon to... A film set, uh, 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 ballet recital, like Philharmonic, whatever. Right. So it's really, there's a lot of applications for photographers, right. especially pros, who need to be completely silent. Right without getting nasty, dirty looks, right? Now, but there's a downside, isn't there? Well, there is, which we'll get to, but the other, the, the main advantages of the, si of the electronic shutter, number one, totally silent. Mm -hmm. Number two, a mechanical shutter has limitations as to how fast it, it can, can shoot. Yeah, how, how fast it can move. Um, 8,000 While I'm talking, they put up the camera to the mic and do one with electronic and one with uh, mechanical so they can hear it or not hear it. I mean, it'll be, um, it'll be cheating when I... I know. So... The, it's totally silent, and it can shoot at incredibly fast speeds because it's not limited by anything mechanical. Okay, ready? So on the SL, what do we got first? Mechanical. Right. It's pretty quiet. This is SL2 mechanical shutter. Right, now at normal distance, so you've been listening to me, if I am here, that's pretty quiet shutter. <laughs> if I put it all the way, I'm touching the mic now, that's about as loud as it gets. It is a very quiet shutter to begin yeah. with. Yeah. Now, it's I'm going to switch to electronic. That's right. And the only sound you hear is me clicking the shutter button. Right, he's pressing it pretty hard. And, so you, you, can... and you can see it actually is taking pictures. Yeah, we do it without making so much noise on the shutter button. Yeah. That's it, there's no noise. It's just the shutter button you're hearing, that's it. So it's silent, and you can shoot on the SL up to a 16 thousandth of a second. Mm -hmm. On the SL2 up to a 40 thousandth of a second. 40 thousandths of a second, which is insane. Which means you could shoot... The 75 Noctilux. No, or the 50 Noctilux. No ND filter, no, no neutral no density filter. filters needed. You know, the bride, the white dress <laughs> on the beach, noon sun in Florida, you can do it. Yep. There is a downside, which is you cannot photograph something that's moving or use it while the camera's moving. Without getting into the complex nature of electronic shutters, effectively what will happen is you'll get what they call the jello effect, where it's like distorted, Ooh, almost to kind of like stretch the picture out. It's basically how the sensor reads out from the top to the bottom. It's not like yeah. just on and off, it it reads out in lines. So if some subject is moving fast enough, it's not it's reading the subject more than once. Right. So to imagine, time. you know, it's reading from top to bottom. And it does this on video too. Mm -hmm. I I probably could get this to do it if I wave my hand fast enough. You probably see my hand looks a little weird. Um, and that's the same effect. So it's the technical term is called rolling shutter. Mm -hmm. The kind of common term is the jelly effect. Yes. Um, so you would get, because video that we're shooting on is an electronic shutter. There's no mechanical shutter in there going 30 frames a second. Right. It is an electronic shutter mechanism. But now if you do stills, it's going to be totally fine for a bride. It's right. going to be fine for, you know, uh, a guy static. playing a violin. Right. Right. That, like, that motion right. is going to be totally fine. But it's not something you want to, like, shoot sports with right. because it's going to look weird. And you really wouldn't because you're not really shooting stuff that quickly it's it's just something to be aware of um, the other limitation is it can't go very slow in mm. terms of like you're not going to do longer than like a quarter second each iso right. has different limitations i don't know them all off yeah. my head but so you the camera has a hybrid functionality um where eff effectively what it does is it'll use the mechanical shutter most of the time yeah I'll show but you if that. you get into a situation where it needs a speed faster than an eight thousandth which is the fastest the mechanical shutter will go it'll roll over automatically to the electronic shutter. So I'll get a call from someone that says, I'm shooting on the beach and suddenly it's not making a noise when I take a picture. That's because it is using the electronic shutter automatically. Yep. So, so you, in, you can see the options there. So we've hybrid, got yeah. mechanical, electronic, and hybrid. Personally, I use hybrid. Yeah, uh, so do I. Because I want to be able to shoot certain lenses wide open without having to worry about overexposure. And... You know, it doesn't happen too often, but especially if I'm shooting like the the 3514 that Josh showed you, um, I will. You know, and I'm in bright daylight. 
definitely I've gone and, and gotten 10, 12, 16 thousandths of a second, easy. Yeah. So I think that was a good question probably to end on. It's getting kind of late. Um, obviously, there are a lot of questions. The SL system is very large, and there's a lot of variables, especially with third-party lenses, or, or I would say adapted lenses. We're definitely going to do a part two, so keep asking questions, leave comments, send have, us we emails. Have, we have just um, one more. I think we're going to end up end with this one. Oh, we got another yeah. one? Oh. Yeah, just okay. a good right. one to finish all with. All right, let's do it. You can go back to us, though. There we go. So, okay. So, Robert is asking, what first lens is recommended for an SL2? Let's say that you already have M lenses, but you want one autofocus lens. Will you recommend the 24 to 90 zoom yes. or for, go for a prime? 24 to 90. 24 to 90. You've already got primes if you have M 10 lenses. out of 10. 24 to 90. Yeah. That lens is, I, I love that lens. That is my like one camera, one lens solution. In fact, we did a video about that. We did. Uh, out shooting in Wynwood, Miami. Uh, you can check it on our channel, and we compared shooting with the 24 to 90 versus actually a bunch of M prime lenses, 24, 35, 50, mm -hmm. 90. Mm -hmm. um, check it out, and you'll see the results. But basically, what I love about the 24 to 90 is that it's the first zoom that I've ever used that is prime lens quality at every single marked focal length mm -hmm. on a zoom. Typically, in the past, has always been that, like, oh, well, zoom is convenient, but primes, primes right. are the best. Primes are king, yeah. Not anymore. I mean, yes, the SL Apo Summicrons are ridiculously sharp. Right. But that 24 to 90, again, even at the higher resolution SL2, just is amazing performance. Yeah. And when I say prime lens quality, I don't mean, like, some other no-name brand. I mean, like, Leica mm -hmm. prime lens quality. Yeah. Uh, it's unheard of. The lens has no weakness. 24, 28, yeah. it's, 35, 50, 75, 90. So it's incredibly Amazing. flexible. It's stabilized. Now, on the SL2, not as big a deal since the SL2 is Although you get stabilized. even more. You get like two more stops. SL601 doesn't have sensor stabilization. So mm -hmm. the 24 to 90 is a way to get stabilization on the SL. Optically. Super sharp. Yep. It's very easy to handle. I know some people say it's large or whatever, but it's like nine lenses in one. So right. I don't. when I go out with the SL2 or the SL and the 24 to 90, I have no bag. I have... A battery in my pocket, an extra SD card in my other pocket, and that's it. It's really not that bad. That's it. So I'm I'm only shooting with a camera and a lens. I have no bag, I have nothing else, and I find it's it's it balances really well. And the flexibility that I have, of course, is weather sealed. And um, yeah, I think that is the perfect lens to start with on the SL or the SL2. And I it really is not bad. I mean, yeah, the balance is is super good. You know, I'm, I'm still able to hold it with one hand without it, like, tipping and If you want over. a little more to grab onto, what I can, what you can do, like, here's a little trick, is use the multifunction grip, um, like this, and then use the hand strap as well. So if you attach the grip, you can then use the, like, uh, hand strap, which, you know, don't, you don't have to put a battery in the grip. Keep the weight down a little bit. Um, so, here we go. There's the grip. And you don't have to actually put the thing on, but just kind of show them what it would look like. Yeah, so that's a hand strap. Right, the grip has the receiving end for the hand strap there. Here. So you see that? So you could, the grip is not just for having an extra battery and, or even Right, so release. basically thread. Yeah. You could also have the hand strap on there. So if, exactly, like exactly. So it gives you a little bit more. So to answer the question, 24 to 90, low brainer. It's so, yeah. so, so good. And it's stabilized and everything else. And I should also mention that it's stabilized on this CL as well. So if you have it like a CL, mm -hmm. You can use the stabilization on the 24 to 90 on this. Yep. I think that's a good way to end. You want to sign us off? Signing off. Yeah. Uh, yeah. All right. Enough, enough of the pretty camera shots. That's right. Good okay. Way. So, as Josh mentioned, uh, I think we've got plenty of questions coming in. Yeah. I mean, I just see them kind of flying by here. Yeah. Uh, plenty of questions that we can get to in a, in a part two. Mm -hmm. So, uh, please... You know, leave a comment either in the live stream or uh, in like an hour or so. YouTube will actually publish this video in permanent form, and then you can make a permanent comment on it. And any comments that you leave, we're going to kind of collect those through the week. And uh, next weekend, we'll be back with another camera talk, mm -hmm. and we will go over part two That's of right. the Leica SL system and dive even more esoteric down the rabbit hole of we SL love, amazingness. We love it. So it. this is, you know, just to reiterate, SL is such a flexible system. Uh, you know, it basically, you can, from the day it came out, it could already take 
over 300 lenses. Yeah, same. Uh, and it's only developing and, and growing. Yeah. So there's a lot to cover. Uh, as I mentioned, we've covered a lot of it already on Red Dot Forum, both in videos and then also in articles. Look down in the description below. Uh, I also mentioned at the start of the video that I also have provided presets for Lightroom that I've made for the SL601 and the SL2. They're also in the description below. So please check those out and enjoy. Um, we really, uh, you know, are honored that you guys choose to spend your time with us. That's right. And, we appreciate uh, it. And totally geek and nerd out over <laughs> all this stuff because, I mean, yeah. we could do this probably, like, nonstop till next week. Yeah, we could literally be just on camera. We could just be on, on camera. camera right. not well for anyone. So, yeah, for hours and hours and hours. Thank you for tuning in and for participating and asking us questions and we appreciate for it. keeping us entertained. We love it. We appreciate it. We are looking forward to engaging with everybody next week. So, everyone, uh, stay good, stay safe, and uh, have a good weekend. Have a good weekend, and we'll see you in the next Camera Talk. Bye-bye. Thanks.